as we look at health and aging. So the first slide that I'm going to bring up right now is a 2015 healthcare study conducted by the folks at the New York Academy of Medicine. It found that 37 percent of older adults reported that primary care services are, quote, not very available or not available at all in some contexts. These are older adults who oftentimes may have some health issues that drive them to medical professionals more often than others in the population, and at least a third of them are saying that they're not very available or available at all. If we go down below and look how respondents reported to mental health services and their availability, 64 percent said those services are not available in at all. So we don't know if there's a perception problem, if they don't know about the programs that are available, or if there simply aren't enough programs available to meet the needs of that 64 percent of people who say they're non-existent. We're going to take a look right now at U.S. mental health in the broader context. A third of widows and widowers meet the criteria for depression within the first month after the death of their spouse. That's a really interesting number when you go down a little bit further and look at suicide rates for older adults for this purpose of their study, ages 65 or older. That rate of suicide is 50 percent higher than that of the general population. And if we continue to go down on the screen, 92 out of every 1,000 older New York City residents were victims of elder abuse over a one-year period. Now, you're looking at losing a long-term partner, you're looking at suicide rates that are elevated and the external factors of abuse that some seniors suffer at the hands of caretakers or oftentimes family members, and it creates a really bad mix that we definitely want to get into and examine when we get into mental health and seniors in the A Block. Recently, New York City's First Lady announced a new initiative expanding mental health programs for seniors throughout the five boroughs. Seniors face a host of mental health and health issues, but often there are gaps in medical care. In addition, there may be cultural and generational hurdles to overcome in getting them the care that they need. And here to tell us how this new initiative and how to provide services to all of the city's aging population are the commissioner for the New York City Department for the aging, Donna Corrado, welcome to BK Live. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And Dr. Jennifer Bresney, the program director at the Division of Geriatrics at Maimonides Hospital. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to jump right into it, uh, Commissioner, if you can. You know, the Thrive NYC program, uh, how is, does this program differ from existing programs that the city has offered throughout the years? Well, this is a, a full court press if you will, around improving access to mental health services throughout the five boroughs. It uh, involves 52 initiatives that tries to destigmatize uh, a person's uh, access and ability to, to get programming. And as you know, the First Lady has been very vocal about her own experience with her own daughter around accessing mental health services. Right. And for all of us who have um, family members, for example, that have mental health issues, you know, once, once something happens, an incident, you realize that a family member needs mental health services, what do you do? Um, she, in her own experience, it was difficult for her to access services for her daughter, who was suffering from depression and some substance abuse issues. But like anyone else, she didn't know where to go, where to turn, and so she did the, the phone tree, calling up, right. and it was just very difficult for her to access service. They weren't readily, readily available. Mm -hmm. So she took that experience and she said, and made this a priority issue, a signature issue um, for the First Lady, and has made um, a lot of progress around expanding the actual programs involving mm -hmm. mental health and also destigmatizing mm -hmm for anyone and all of us around receiving mental health services. It's normalizing it in, in essence. So Dr. Bersney, we know that in the de Blasio family, uh, she had a mom who could be there and advocate for her and see that things were a little off and this isn't the daughter that I recognize. When you work with a geriatric population, who's advocating for them? Who is saying, oh, things might be a little off? Do, pres do patients have to self-present and say, I'm feeling away before a medical person would intervene? 
It's an excellent question. So I think that one of the difficulties we have with the, uh, let's say, average old, somebody who's 75 mm -hmm. or older, or somebody who's very old, somebody 85 and older, is that they often are isolated socially. Um, and they don't come to care unless there's a hospital stay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the major barriers overall that we face with the elderly is that they have a threshold um, event that brings them to care. And then we start to think about all the issues that they are facing in addition to mental health. Right. Um, I felt 50% of the people I see in my practice come with somebody, um, whether it's a spouse or a child or just a friendly family member uh, mm -hmm. or neighbor. So um, it varies, but I think the I idea of isolation is really important. Well, you know, New York City is a city I've come, grown to, uh, to love, and I plan on being here a really long time. Mm -hmm. Are there specific um, mental health issues or health issues that um, an aging population in New York City specifically will run into as opposed to elsewhere in the country? You know, despite being a, a very dense population, you'll be surprised at the number of people who are actually socially isolated. Although they're living around many other people for various reasons, whether it's a, a life transition, a major life event such, such as retirement, or in general, if you just look at the housing stock, for example, in Brooklyn alone, mm -hmm. many of them are multifamily buildings without elder, um, elevators. And if you're on a fifth floor walk up, for example, and you have some mobility impairment and you're not able to get down the steps because there's no elevator or the elevator is out not working, you cannot get out. And then your world becomes very constricted. So you lose your social connections. If you've retired, you've lost those connections with people at work that you go to every day if you've lost a spouse right. and on and on and on. So these series of losses and some physical impairments, just by virtue of the fact that you live in a in an urban area doesn't necessarily mean that you're involved and connected uh, socially. So Dr. Brisney, when people do find their way into a hospital or some kind of clinical setting, how receptive are seniors to accepting these services? And we know that the First Lady's done a lot to destigmatize mm -hmm. the need for mental health services, but they come from a generation where right. it was not as pronounced as we are today with understanding these right. things? I would say that um, they're equally as receptive. Okay. My, my experience has been that the elderly are re recognize that there's stigma, but it's very much the same in the general population. Um, and one of the major problems with looking at mental health issues, and specifically depression, mm -hmm. is that it overlaps tremendously with cognitive impairment caused by other problems, gotcha. where there is a tremendous amount of stigma. So things like uh, dementia, uh, delirium following a hospital stay, there's a lot of overlap there with depression. And evaluating those issues can often be, um, and treating them properly can often be very difficult. Well, we have such a diverse population. Um, how does it sort of, the demographics break down, um, or how do these stigmas sort of play out, or access to the facilities uh, and services play out among different, uh, you know, uh, cultural populations? Um, so I could I answer that and tie it to another um, response to your, uh, your previous question. I'd say that that's the richness of the mm -hmm. city, right, is that we work um, at Maimonides and all over the city with uh, people from Bangladesh, people who are originally African American from all over the country, people yeah. who are from the, uh, the islands and uh, China. Um, the diversity of approaches to mental health in those populations, their um, attitude towards advanced care planning and end of life issues um, make it difficult but also make it very exciting. And I think ultimately remaining open to how differences um, may impact a situation is relevant to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, we all may have different approaches to depression, even though we're from the same culture, same background. Mm -hmm. So it just highlights that even more so in New York. You know, one thing I do want to add as I was reading mm -hmm. through um, the report, you know, the one thing I want to add about depression is depression is a very, very, a highly successfully treatable uh, condition uh, when it's identified. So. When, it's ident when it's identified. Um, and linked to, to depression, of course, is social isolation. Mm -hmm. And the city, we're fortunate that we have such a, a, 
a rich array of services that are available to people yeah. so that they can be socially connected. Tell us specifically about the Homebound Visitors Program okay, so and what happens so, when you do this. Thing. Sure, so there's part of the uh, New York City Thrive are two initiatives that involve seniors specifically. Mm -hmm. One of them is a friendly visiting program that we're running out of our 22 case management programs throughout the city in all five boroughs that we have a volunteer coordinator who trains volunteers to go in and visit seniors for an hour a week and you know it's a light touch intervention but one which we hope will really uh, ameliorate a lot of the the depression yeah. um, and really prevent depression and social isolation for homebound seniors. It's good to have something on your yeah, schedule, absolutely. like yeah, I'm having a visitor. Exactly, you're having a visitor yeah. um, and also for seniors who are you know well and getting out in the community and able to do that they can become a volunteer as well so we encourage that. This is a program that we hope that will you know grow and multiply yeah. over time so if any peer. seniors are interested in volunteering they can call 311 and certainly call the Department for the Aging. Um, as well as we're integrating seniors and embedding them in our senior centers, mental health workers. So the stigma around engaging somebody in mental health services, if it's somebody that's familiar to them, mm -hmm. someone that they know and they build trust, they're more apt to receive treatment and services. So this is an, an initiative um, that we started this year at 15 of our centers and we'll, we'll grow this to 25 centers. Yeah. Uh, next year. So doctor, we uh, we hear about this phenomenon of aging in place and Aaron touched on the fact that he's going to age in place oh, right here God. in New York. So what are the benefits of aging in place, particularly when you have interventions from the city that, mm -hmm. you know, that can help to ease some of the social isolation that might come? Well, I mean, there are a lot of different forms of aging in place. There are certainly structures like um, the NORC uh, I don't know if you've discussed that already, but basically there are structures that are very specific that right. have services in place that can provide medical and social services to um, seniors as they One age. One-stop shopping. One-stop, yeah. exactly. Um, most people can't benefit from that kind of um, a setup, mm -hmm. but aging in place in your neighborhood means you're still connected to your church, your synagogue, um, your mosque, uh, yeah. whatever social... Um, a club you are. We all know that mayor of the block, the oldest person on the block. Yes. And we're like, you yes. know him. You're it's part powerful. of the fabric. Right. Mm -hmm. So those those kind of connections, I mean, getting back to what you were right. saying about social isolation, um, we're just learning what it means to be a 95 year old, you know, in mm -hmm. large quantities. Yeah. And I think what we're learning more than anything is that it's very isolating. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, one of the things I, I read recently, and, and one of the reasons why, why we choose to live here, you're not originally from here yourself, but <laughs> New Yorkers live so long. I was really, really surprised to, to look at the national raid and, as opposed to, to New Yorkers. Sorry. And it's because of, of that interconnectedness. It's because mm -hmm. we have a dense population. It's because your neighbor can say, hey, you're not looking so good. Maybe you should check this person out or give this person a call. So mm -hmm. it's also a matter of just sort of looking out for each other. Uh, you know, we only have maybe one minute left. I just wanted to, to ask you, Commissioner, um, drug use among among seniors, is this something that's also being um, targeted by this by this initiative? Not specifically for the, the two geriatric mental health initiatives that I've, that I've spoken about, but it really is a hidden problem within older adults and the way that um, alcohol, for example, affects an older person is very different than than someone you know a middle-aged person yeah. naturally for for many many reasons their medications are different their tolerance to alcohol is different and if you're alone and you're drinking um, there's really no one to, that that's going to say to you you know stop that or whatever so uh, the prevalence of substance abuse and its relation to uh, falls for example mm -hmm. really uh, it impacts uh, the whole health of, of the person and as we know falls lead to hospitalizations yeah. and to broken That's hips and, and broken limbs reaction. which is a chain reaction yeah. and then they go into the hospital and then suffer some home. type of those delirium and depression in the hospital and then they stay in the hospital and we know what what that that path leads to yeah. um, so it's a serious problem and it's one that that we need to put more resources towards and pay more attention to for sure well, Commissioner, thank Doctor, thank you both for being here. If any of that was useful to you, you want to hear more, 
watch it back or just dial up 311. They can get you connected. There you go. 311 is simple. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you.